thank you very much, Rangi, for your kind words of introduction. And uh, I'm also very happy and privileged uh, to be here uh, along with my uh, colleagues and friends, uh, 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 scholars, uh, and also with our few uh, students. Um, yes, as Rangi has said, I've been here before. And so please, uh, please consider it uh, uh, a privilege to, to, to be speaking to uh, students in Mizoram, uh, especially because uh, I have never really taught here. And so it's always, uh, I find it a great opportunity whenever I, I am able to be watching the whole So I mean, I, think, I don't have much time, and I'm not going to spend too much time as well. Uh, uh, yesterday, everybody was uh, blaming William for the kind of uh, uh, topics that they, uh, you know, that they were asked to speak and today, I too will do the same. Because when I ask you, what am I supposed to speak on, is it speak on your latest book? So what I'm going to do today is uh, talk about my book, talk this book with this uh, book with, uh, with uh, you know, Man Sandal. Uh, but also, I think it also falls within the large domain and area that we're looking at about uh, the, the condition of the social as a whole. And uh, because in some senses this work uh, enables us to go beyond the human, you know, as, as the title says, in the human histories. So to go beyond the human, and uh, yesterday Ram mentioned about um, the idea of the Anthropocene and how that has taken over, taken hold over the way we have written our histories. <coughs> and so today, I think uh, what we're trying to do for this book is to talk about how um, the non-human world has actually um, um, made a mark on our lives and how we've constituted our lives. And this is especially relevant for uh, people from the Northeast because of the way uh, uh, we seem to be much closer to nature, seem to be, I would say, seem to be much closer to nature. But also, I think, um, at, um, at on various fronts, at various levels, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, being able to see our history through these interactions or through these entanglements with nature is important because in the writing of our history, I'm going to start off with trying to problematize the writing of our histories in Mizoram and in the Northeast, and then we want to talk about why it is important to talk about these entanglements and how that has constituted our history. And then try and see ways in our past about how these entanglements have worked out. Okay, so that's basically what I'm going to be trying to do today. So the first thing is, as you know, in the Northeast, history writing is all about identity. It's all about, say, the Mizo identity, or if you look now, the identity, and within that, the identity of uh, what you may call sub tribes or tribes, depending on how you look at it. You know, whether it's the Aumagas, 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 Mizos, and all the Mizos, Maras, and, and many other groups. And, and this, um, as a result of this, uh, we are unable to look at our past as a past that has actually uh, uh, been developed as a result of interactions and uh, uh, communication with the uh, world. We are unable to see our past as a constitution of historical contingencies. Okay? So we see our, our past as being something that is extremely static in some ways, that has not evolved, and uh, and we see our identity as being bounded by a territory. We consider the territory as a given. And I think there are lots of problems with writing history like that. At the same time, I know that in, in this day and age, especially in the context of Mizoram, there is this idea of a greater uh, Mizo identity or a greater as I would say, a Zo identity. Now, we have to see, and uh, yesterday Ram gave me a very, very important lecture, especially for people from the Northeast, about how the chauvinism or nationalism uh, has contributed to, you know, and this it, it is so relevant for us here because the way we see our history as the greater Mizo or greater Mizo, and if you trace these developments, you realize that you know the Mizo identity for some stretches right from the Naga Hills, you know, from down there to till 
the Jitwong River tribe. So this expansion of uh, the Mizo identity and try attempt at historicizing those identities, those are all extremely problematic. So I think what is very, very important is therefore to think of ways in which historical contingencies have, have developed, how history has evolved, the evolution of um, uh, of uh, various aspects of that history is something that we need to bear in mind. So, in many ways, you know, uh, what is important is to try and conceptualize space in a different manner, in a different manner. So, uh, so this is what this book entangled uh, lines attempts to do. So, we con conceptualize uh, space in a, in a different manner, so much so that we call this region as the Eastern Himalayas. Uh, sorry, Eastern Triangle, sorry. And we try to see it as an ecological space. Uh, not so much uh, a space that is bounded by, uh, by political boundaries, but more or less as an ecological uh, space. Okay, so that is uh, our attempt here. So, um, um, I, so this is the basic region that we're going to go beyond. Uh, the political boundaries as I mentioned and I talk about uh, the kind the entangled lives in this particular region that is uh, the eastern Himalayas that is bounded by the east, uh, eastern Himalayas in the north, the Indo uh, Indo Arakan Yoma or the Indo Indo Burma uh, mountain ranges and of course the Chicago Hill tracks. That is a particular kind of uh, triangle that we are looking at. And in some way it is also bounded, it is also considered a a sort of distinct ecological zone uh, as well. So uh, we try and look at the flora and fauna of this region and look at the ways in which uh, uh, the flora and fauna of this region has helped in the constitution of life in the region. Okay? So I'm not going to talk too much about plants here at the moment because it's uh, much time as well. But this is the particular uh, sort of uh, zoo geographic zone. Uh, that we are talking about and this particular region is part of what is known as the indo malian uh, 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 geographic zone. Now, um, uh, we all know this region quite well, so I won't go into the details, but you know, from the time of the colonial uh, officials, we know about the variety of uh, uh, fauna that exists in the, uh, in the region and uh, this particular region, what we call as a triangle, has the highest mammalian and avian diversity with around 240 and 900 uh, species. Of course, at the same time, uh, many of them now fall under the endangered list, and uh, seven of the 11 mammals uh, listed as critically endangered from India are from the Northeast. And uh, 57 vulnerable species of birds in India. Of the 57 vulnerable species of birds in India, 42 were recorded in the uh, triangle alone. So, uh, so we, we, we also must realize that increasingly this is this region is an endangered, uh, endangered uh, zone. Now, um, so this is a you know this was a picture that was taken in the late 19th uh, century, and it's that of a flying person. But it is 26 inches across and 4 inches in, in length. Okay, so I don't think we get to see such uh, uh, big, uh, I mean, this fine school anymore. It's not part of our uh, day to day uh, lives anymore, but it is what was definitely found in this uh, region. Okay, so, anyway, now one of the things I want to get to the paper which is that uh, this diversity of uh, uh, the, the flora and fauna has impacted the life forms of the inhabitants of the of the region. And therefore the intent is to understand this nature of the non human, non human relations, which is an important constitutive feature of the region. Actually many a times we don't we we take it in our stride in a certain sense and we don't recognize how much uh, we draw from this uh, animal uh, uh, world. And for instance uh, uh, you know in the way for instance the Nagas today identify themselves very often as a marker of the identity in places like these morons, which are uh, which are uh, modern morons that are built for the Hornbill festival, as you might know, you find that 
uh, but you know, uh, the, the way you constitute yourself is to animals. I mean, as you can see here, uh, you know, there is a, of course, the human figurine, but there is also a little bit of an elephant, a monkey, and these are therefore the symbols that are employed for a cognac model. That's another example of that, of a Santa model, which includes reptiles as well. So, uh, so this is, it, it is in a way a kind of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, uh, self-representation. Uh, so, uh, there are also one of the things about animals is that, you know, certain animals take uh, precedence in the symbolic uh, uh, spectrum. And uh, it's also interesting that uh, the precedence also changes over time, which animal gains precedence over time. So you see that, for instance, um, uh, in places like what Simmons and Simmons calls, um, they call it the middle country. Now that is evident enough, but you realize that the middle, or what we call the, um, what's it called, the middle? Sia. Sia, yeah. Sorry. The Sia is something that is only endemic to regions that are 2,000 feet above sea level. Uh, between 2,000 feet above sea level, and I think it is about 8,000 feet. Okay, it doesn't live uh, above that, it doesn't live below that. And it is only therefore available in the mountains of Arunachal Pradesh, and then coming down into the indo burma Park. So even in the northeast, it is not uh, uh, available everywhere, and of course it is not available in other regions of the world. So uh, the mission is a particular animal, and it has, in most of these cultures, it has it, it is a very interesting animal in that uh, it holds great symbolic value. You know, cultural self-identification, you realize you have a little head everywhere. But at the same time, it is a semi-domesticated animal. It is, uh, it is, um, uh, it is not milk. It is, uh, it, it is only used for its meat. And that is not on an everyday basis. It is only used at times of festivals and rituals as well. So in many ways, uh, uh, the Muslim is a very important animal for a particular region in the mountains. But then similarly, there are also animals like the snake, okay? reptiles and the snake, which are important in certain uh, cultures. And it is important as well as uh, an animal that is feared. Like for instance, among the Khasis, we all know the story about the ten, and in fact, it is considered a living legend. So it's so much so that people still today uh, feel that there is a person who takes care of the ten and people are scared of such people, right? So the snake is a very important, is a very fierce symbol. Okay, so this is the little here. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and, uh, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so, yeah, the snake plays a very important role in the mythology of the, of the castle, but also among the maidens, for instance. The Ninkandra is one of the symbols they were supposed to have uh, emerged from a snake, if I'm not mistaken, or they consider the snake an ancestor of sorts. And it, is, it forms part of the uh, symbolism of the Ninkandra uh, dynasty as well. So, uh, but then there is also an evolving uh, importance of animals. Like for instance, uh, today Assam uh, is, uh, is uh, sort of identified with the rhinoceros, right? It's identified with the rhinoceros and if you use Assam oil, you have Assam tea, all of them will have a rhino as a, as a symbol. But this was not seen in the past because in the past elephants were more uh, important in Assam. And in fact, you have treatises in the 18th century, there is a treatise uh, called the Hasti Vidya Ranya, if I'm not mistaken, uh, written by Sikumar Barke, that talks about how, uh, how elephants should be reared and looked after and things like that. So you see, and then of course the Ahoms actually came with horses. So when the Ahoms came in the 12th, 13th century, they came with horses, but then these horses were given up and then they took on elephants uh, uh, as because they were important in warfare, but in modern times Assam is usually associated with rhinoceros. So you see that there are changing, evolving ways in which uh, uh, in which uh, humans have sort of identified with, with certain uh, animals. Now, uh, the question is like, uh, why therefore should we study uh, 
uh, this entanglements with animals. And this is because I think I find uh, Brian Morse's work called Animals and Ancestors and Ethnography a very, very uh, important uh, work. And he says that animals have always been an essential part of our history, culture, and existence. And um, ever since the appearance of modern humans and human culture, humans have always lived in close proximity to animals and have shared the same life worlds. So uh, human life has not been independent of the animal world. And in many ways, the latter has also formed and made a society. So uh, according to him, Brian Morris, that is, uh, the nature of this relationship is not complex. It is, uh, it is, it is not sim simple. It is complex, intimate, reciprocal, personal, and most importantly, crucially ambivalent. So I like what he said, that this relationship with animals is not always very uh, simple. Like for instance, I think the general understanding of ourselves as people of the Northeast is that we are meat eaters, uh, off late missiles, for instance, are dog lovers and cat lovers, and you know there are societies nowadays uh, that are extremely sort of uh, uh, possessive about uh, taking or you know taking care of dogs and cats and pets and things like that. But generally, we see as a sort of a meat loving people, uh, and that is the idea that we have of ourselves in animals. But we realize that actually, if you think about it much more carefully, we have a very, very sort of intricate and complex understanding of of these of this animal world. Like for instance, why do we think it is necessary that at a Christmas feast we should sacrifice a beast or we should have at least, you know, any any vein that is considered itself a vein will want to have CR that is uh, if I'm not correct, if I'm not wrong, right? Most Veins in ISO, for instance, want to spot a CR besides the cow uh, or the pig or whatever. So, uh, why do we consider that? Why do we have so much of sort of uh, thing about about this method? Okay, so that so there are things like that that we have to think about and we have to uh, consider. So, um, so I just want to trace in many ways. I'm just really uh, uh, rushing in here, but I just want to trace the many ways in which uh, animals have sort of made up the life world of the people of uh, Northeast India. And uh, I'll give examples from among the lizards and but also amongst other communities as well. Now, one of the things about uh, uh, the, the region is that in all our myths and origin stories, we have an animal. You know, we have an animal. Like, for instance, in the case of the lizard, we have an earthworm uh, which was involved in the creation of the mud. I don't know whether you all know the story. We have an earthworm that is involved in the creation of the mud. Among the gardens, uh, it was a spider. Uh, uh, and so there are many, many stories like that. Okay, I won't go into detail. The other thing is that many of us uh, have uh, considered animal as skin, as relatives. Okay, like for instance, uh, among the Angami Nagas, uh, uh, the, the tiger, the spirit and the human were considered siblings. Okay, so the tiger, the spirit, and the human were considered as siblings. And then one day the mother said that uh, she was very angry at the way the tiger was eating its food. It didn't have table manners at all. So then she said that uh, uh, I'll throw a stick and whoever reaches that place first, uh, uh, they will stay at home. And the one who reaches the place second will have to stay in the jungle. So the spirit and the and the human uh, collaborated. And so when the mother threw the uh, threw the stone, um, the spirit before well, the the spirit before the human could reach said that I have reached. And so therefore, whereas the the, the tiger could not speak out obviously, and so the tiger was. Uh, second in arriving at the spot. So therefore, as a result, the humans were sort of uh, uh, lords of the village or lord of the cult of culture, whereas the tiger is uh, uh, lord of the jungle. Okay? So therefore, they came down to have these kind of two positions. But what is interesting, therefore, is that such myths actually, we may consider them stories, but they were what is known as the balances for action. That kind of a story 
make people have unique relationship with the tiger. So for instance, among the uh, Angra meats, tiger meat is never eaten. Okay, tiger meat is never eaten because uh, the tiger is considered a sibling. Okay, so the tiger is considered a sibling. So you realize that these stories have uh, an impact on, have had an impact on the way people understood nature or related with uh, with nature. Okay, so for instance, on the other hand, uh, uh, the Chang Nagas could eat the flesh of the leopard but not that of the tiger. Okay, so there, there were those kinds of differences as well. I won't get into great detail about it. So um, the other thing, of course, is that um, uh, what is interesting is that for all these animals also sort of uh, pretty, uh, had an impact on how uh, society was organized. Uh, uh, whether in terms of gender relations, whether in terms of social hierarchy, uh, whether in terms of status as well. Okay, so for instance, uh, I'll give an example of, uh, uh, like for instance, hunt. Hunting was considered a man's activity. And hunting, like for instance, amongst the Molo in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, you had to ask the forest spirit uh, 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 um, you have to ask the uh, forest spirit for permission in order to be able to hunt and once you have not had permission you could hunt but when you hunt it, the animals could not be given the same name as um, as uh, you know, as what they were called in the city so the animals have to be addressed in a different sort of uh, uh, name like, uh, quite, something quite similar is like for instance in Mizzou, uh, you you would call it the, you call the tiger sakay, but you also call it its sakay. You know, so you have a different name for the tiger, you call it sakay. So similarly, uh, amongst the Molo and Arunachal Pradesh also, you have similar kinds of But what is interesting is that, like, uh, some women of course would not go for hunt, but in certain tribes in, in Nagaland, for instance, or around, the women could not cook the meat of the, of the animals that was hunted. Or the women could not, or uh, 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 the meat had to be cooked outside the house, you know. So, uh, so, and then of course we know uh, in the this whole sort of uh, uh, idea of khanswa also that the killing of certain animals, um, the killing of certain animals um, uh, made you have uh, access into the afterlife, right? You have to give a certain number of animals to be a khanswa and then that comes for gave you status as being a warrior and also that comes for ever gave you a status in the afterworld as well or access in the afterworld as well. So you see that this relationship with animals and with tigers and with all kinds of uh, sort of animals is the one that is sort of creating a particular kind of um, uh, view of the afterlife. It's, it, 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 it's very important in, in the cosmological life of people. Another example that I will give is that of uh, the Ponyaks. The Ponyaks, of course, apparently you have to kill about 40 mutons in order to be able to have this similar status that we have for the uh, uh, But what is interesting among the, uh, among the Ponyaks is also that people of the chieftain's family could eat, only those people could eat certain meats and people of the lower classes could eat certain meat. So I think, uh, I, I just, I'm just forgetting, but like for instance, uh, the goat and bear meat could not be eaten by the commoners. Okay? So what, what, what that points out to is like, um, unlike, say, in, in subcontinental India, uh, which works in notions of purity and pollution, um, and uh, so in, in similar ways, there are these kinds of hierarchies that are being created, but it is hierarchies that are being created on the uh, on access or eating of certain meats or non eating of certain meats. So what you're trying to see here is that animals have sort of played a very very important part in uh, in social organization and uh, and uh, and you know creating gender uh, gender uh, differences uh, and, and and things like that. So I'm going to just over many things that I wanted to say here, and um, of course, in Mithun country again, uh, you know, the Mithun is the highest uh, 
and it will uh, sacrifice. But uh, what I wanted to therefore, you know, I'm just trying to include here now, uh, is just to say that um, you know that non-human animals have have contributed to the constitution of the people of the region, um, uh, and this non-human relation perspective enables us to see the region in terms of also uh, cultural geographies, okay? That is, uh, the spatial dimension of more than human histories. So, uh, uh, so in many ways, these spatial dimensions have been understood traditionally in binaries such as forest people and settled agriculture, slash and burn versus settled agriculture, primitive versus civilized. But there are many other alternate spaces in the triangle, uh, which, are, which can be based on human non human interactions. For instance, the interplay of microbial organisms, animals, and plants creates spatial patterns that change over time with human and non human mobilities. Okay? So, uh, and some of these cultural geographies are rooted in tribal ideas and traditions, others in the imagination of outsiders. So, this, uh, so this region as a as a sort of uh, spatial category can be imagined when we think of it in interaction with different kinds of animals, maybe microorganisms, uh, maybe plants as well. And I'll just give you a quick uh, two examples and then I'll stop there, which is that, you know, <coughs> uh, in terms of microorganisms, if you think about it, you know, most of the people in the Northeast are lactose intolerant. You know, and we share this kind of lactose intolerance with a lot of people from uh, East Asia as well. You know, so which is that if if you didn't know it, and if you have always felt why why do you feel, why does your sort of uh, why do you feel sort of uh, what's the word pardon as you call it uh, a, a bit uh, acidic when you drink milk? It's because of the lactose intolerance. So and we share that kind of and it's the lack of a uh, a, a, a microorganism that prevents you from being able to uh, digest uh, milk. Okay? So in that sense, you can see that we are part of a particular kind of a cultural uh, sort of zone. The other thing is, of course, about, which I often mention is in terms of plants is glutinous rice. You know, glutinous rice or sticky rice or bun, as we call it here, is something that is not prevalent uh, west of Northeast India. It's only cultivated in Northeast India, and we share this with the rest of uh, uh, Asia, East Asia, Eastern Asia as well. So, in many, uh, so, uh, so if you think about this region in terms of these kinds of cultural spaces, you realize that we share uh, continuities with, uh, or spatial continuities with people from other regions or regions uh, in in Asia as well. So, I think. Um, I have a little, a lot more to say, but I think since we're running short of time, it's already 15. I will stop there. But I just want to conclude by saying that uh, uh, that we need to consider these kinds of entanglements that we've had, whether we do this with plants or whether it is with animals in our history. We have to consider the evolving nature of these entanglements, and these entanglements enable us to see space in different ways. Uh, we, we move beyond our political boundaries, we move beyond our uh, like preconceived notions of difference across boundaries, and we are able to see spatial continuities uh, based on these kinds of uh, interactions that we have. So I'll stop here, and maybe uh, when we have questions, we can, uh, we can deal with them later. So thank you very much.